All right, peace and greetings, YouTubers. So, the Bobby Brown story, where do we begin? Let me just start out by saying that, to be honest, in comparison to the New Edition um, series, I think the New Edition series was much more centered and, and sound and polished. And there was just, the way that it was put together just made it more entertaining and more enjoyable. This story, I think, is entertaining, but there are some bits that just make me side-eye a lot of things, and it makes it really, really hard to just enjoy. You know what I mean? But we'll, we'll get to it as we get to it. But anyway, the movie, I mean, hell, the movie starts out with him overdosing or something. I was like, damn, they just get right to the drugs, huh? Um, <laughs> but, you know, the thing is this. Bobby Brown, growing up, was one of my favorite, favorite, favorite people like when I was like I mean I wasn't old enough to really re remember the don't be cruel era but I was old enough to remember the Bobby era and when I was that age I was about three four five that whole time period like some of my favorites at that time were MC Hammer Bobby Brown TLC was a favorite I really liked Heavy D I really liked Father MC I really liked Big Daddy Kane um who else was I really into it oh Redhead Kingpin if you remember him he was like a rapper he was like a light skin rapper with red hair I really liked him um, God, who else did I really listen to? Uh, Boys of Men had just kind of come out. I used to really like their music. Um, and then I liked a lot of the, the house acts that were out at the time. So I really liked Black Box and I really liked um, CNC Music Factory and, and Crystal Waters and all them. So Bobby Brown was definitely, he got a lot of airplay at that time. Like I remember Bobby's music was everywhere. Um, so I was excited to watch this film because Bobby, to me, I think sometimes doesn't get a lot of the credit he should as an entertainer. But I think that comes from just the fact that his lifestyle over ended up overpowering, you know, his career. And that's what you know him for. So anyway, getting into the movie, I think if I had any critiques about the music, first of all, let's just start with the music. I hate that they use auto-tune in, in this series. It just, it takes away from how good the music was. Like, here's the thing. Bobby Brown sang with so much grit during his heyday. So when you're hearing the replicas of, you know, his, some of his biggest hits... And, and and the vocal arrangements that they're using it comes off very kids boppish because it's too it's so polished and so mechanical sounding i'm like it just took all the grit and the funk and soul out what, what y'all doing like that um version of my prerogative was killing me to sit through it was killing me i think rock which is sounded a bit better but my prerogative killed me i was like y'all y'all gotta really fix the music and that was the thing i was like i think the music in the new edition flick, I think they kind of had the same kind of production styles, but it seemed to work out much better because I still honestly say that version they had of Can You Stand the Rain was so good. It was so good. I almost liked it more than the original. Um, but yeah, so that was that. Um, but I, I think because Bobby Brown's life is so dynamic as far as the extremes, it must be pretty hard to capture all of that in the story. But then at the same time, it's also hard to question and... and 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 sit on what's true and what isn't only because listen no disrespect to bobby but bobby was always high so it's hard to tell when he was telling the truth or not because this is the same man that said he taught michael jackson the moonwalk and i'm like no no you didn't because the dude from shalimar taught michael the moonwalk he like they both e even admitted to that so i'm like bobby what were you doing and then i just ain't never seen you do it before and then i'm like this is the same dude that said he slept with a ghost um i there's just certain things that make it hard to always take everything he says as truth even though i do think a lot of what he says is true there's other moments where i'm like okay i don't know when the drugs are talking and when bobby is talking and now you know bobby's clean now he's been really like living his life and he's in a good space but i'm like i don't even know if you got brain damage from all the stuff he was doing back in the day so it's hard to <laughs> it's hard to kind of understand what's truth and what isn't but anyway um i think the other issue I may have had with the movie is just how a lot of black women in the film are portrayed. Um, Bobby lived a lifestyle that was very in the moment. He did a little bit of everything, you know what I mean? And the way that it's painted in this film is that he's a victim to all the women he encounters. And I don't know if I buy that. You know what I mean? Um, even with the girl who was the baby's mother and who was on the video set with him when he did like that first music video, even the way that they presented her, they made her seem as if she's problematic because she needs him to be involved because he's had this child, but he's kind of neglecting her and not showing around. And the way that they presented her is, okay, it's this loud mouth 
hood rat girl that shows up at the video set ready to shut everything down because Bobby ain't doing his part. Like, that's the way that uh, that was presented. And then even, God, don't get me started on Janet Jackson. Yo. <sighs> I do believe they did, they did have a relationship. I don't know, however, if the way that it was presented to us is how it all went down. Because the way it came off to me, damn. It made her seem like super insensitive, like she was just kind of using him for a good time and that's it. And that, you know, she wasn't going to marry him because he wasn't of her caliber and all that. And my thing with that is, I just don't, I didn't see, I don't think their relationship ever got to that point where it was ever going to be a conversation about marriage. Because just looking at the timeline, and that's the other thing I didn't like, is like they pushed out, you know, that she was supposed to marry that Renee Elizondo dude. So I'm like, now you're making it as if, okay, so you're saying that Janet cheated on the husband she was secretly married to before she married him. Is that what you're saying? And then the whole thing that got me was it kept being painted as, as okay, well, Janet doesn't like black men. Janet, um, you know, her family is kind of like these health, these very rich, bougie-ass black people who hate their blackness. And so Bobby Brown, she can't date Bobby Brown because he's black. And I was like, no, I didn't get that. I was like, really, in my opinion, I think Janet recognized that, okay, Bobby got a few problems and Bobby is one step from a drug addict. Why? Because I used to be married to one. Because remember, she was with that DeBarge boy. She talked about that in her book saying, you know, back in the day, she'd have to be looking for her husband at three and four in the morning driving through back alleys and he's in the alley over there high as a kite. And then she got to go bring him home and everything like that. And so I think she already saw the signs that maybe he was on his way to something she didn't want to be a part of. That's what I got from it. Or that's how I interpreted their relationship or what, what it was. And I mean, he painted this out like he loved the girl and was going to, you know, marry her. But I was like, he, he was already sleeping with eight other people at the same time. So I'm like, you can't present yourself to be a victim of being heartbroken, but you sleeping with eight and nine women at the same time. Make it make sense. That was that was the only bit I, I, I didn't understand. I was like, man. And then even with him buying her the car, I'm sorry, Bobby, at that point in time, you were new money. Janet was technically new money as well, but she grew up in new money. So you buying her a car, she already doesn't seen that. It ain't nothing she ain't had already. Like I remember Jermaine Dupri was talking about when they used to have them arguments. He used to say he used to get under her skin because literally things that because she grew up, you know, the way she grew up, like, yo, there was nothing he could do that she hadn't already seen before and that she hadn't already experienced. There wasn't a place he could take her she hadn't already been because, you know, she grew up rich. So, you know, that's that. But enough on Janet. I, I just I think I have an issue with that because it looks weird on BET's part that you have that paint Janet in that light. But you're going to honor her on Sunday with Black Girls Rocking. You got her commercial and stuff all on the thing. But I'm like, y'all bashing her at the same time. So how does that work? Okay. You already know people like to bash Janet all the time. Like, I can imagine a barbershop conversation tomorrow between this and people still believing the rumor about Janet making Tupac take an AIDS test. God. And by the way, like, John Singleton has already gone out of his way and said, no, that wasn't true. You know, we kind of put that out there because it was great promo for the Poetic Justice movie. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. I'm just going to say there's going to be a lot of people... Um, who are going to probably be cooking Janet for like the next few weeks based on this movie and just some of the assumptions they have about her. But um, there, there were things that were off. And then even with that um, and him meeting Whitney, um, it was weird how they, they, you know, they show her that they meet at the Soul Train Awards. And of course, yeah, Whitney got booed. Um, I wish they would have put that in a better context so people could understand why. Like if you remember, this is the time period when Whitney's on her second album. Her team has pretty much gone out of their way to really market her as a pop artist and keep her marketed to white audiences. They didn't really, you know, when she'd go on a promo tour, she'd skip the black station. She would skip some of the, you know, the black publications, not by a choice of her own, but just by what her team wanted to do. Because, you know, this, if you've ever followed my R&B is Dead series, Whitney came out at a time when R&B was temporarily not the mainstream because of the backlash that came from the disco sucks era and everything like that radio stations stopped playing pretty much anything with a kick that was associated with a black face so when they did the rollout for Whitney Houston because she got signed and I want to say in 83 and she didn't come out till 85 they were very strategic with how they put her out because they wanted to make sure that she would not fall into that that box of okay she's one of those black artists that all the mainstream radio stations are not gonna play and so I mean they kept pushing that and pushing that and it eventually worked against her within the black community by the time she got to her second album because people were like, yo, she is, uh, she's kind of a sellout, you know. And so they showed her getting booed, but I was like, y'all probably should have put that in a better context so it made sense. Um, so that was kind of interesting. But then with that, I'm like, so was he dating her or what? Because, you know, they talk about the Bobby Brown on our own song for Ghostbusters, but I'm like, Bobby Brown took Karen White to that uh 
release party. So I'm like, was he with Whitney or was he with Karen White? You remember Karen White, the turn the lights down, boom, time to get romantic, like that Karen White. So I'm like, you just, Bobby was, listen, I will say Bobby got it in. <laughs> Bobby was sleeping with everybody and everything. I was like, Bobby <laughs> was living his best life. My God. Uh, but what I wish they would have done on Bobby's behalf, I don't think they did a great job of capturing just how big Bobby was during the Don't Be Cruel era. You have to think about the time that that album came out. One, there was not really a prominent R&B male entertainer who was just as massive. Like, Don't Be Cruel sold like 10 million albums. If you have that album, like it's, it's a classic. Like, literally, just the first five tracks alone. You put that album on, boom, and it's Don't Be Cruel. Right after that, boom, it's My Prerogative. Right after that, boom, is I want to say Roni comes next. And then right after Roni, I think, is Rock With You and then Every Little Step. Like, the first five songs, you're like, damn, this album, it, it knocks. But, you know, that mess sold 10 million albums. And when you just go back to that time period, at that moment in time, there wasn't really any other super huge major black superstar out at that second. Michael Jackson was kind of on a hiatus because the bad era had just ended. You know, he just finished the bad tour. We weren't going to see Michael again until 91 with Dangerous. Prince was going in an artistically creative direction elsewhere, in a different direction. So kids in the hood weren't going out of their way to really play Prince, but the music heads were enjoying him. And so Bobby comes out at the time, I mean, you know, he had that first album nobody cared about. But with Don't Be Cruel, now there's new sounds coming out. You know, you have the emergence of New Jack Swing. That is just, you know, because Janet's like, what, the nasty song was one of the first songs to have the, the swing beat. And then Teddy Riley comes and takes that sound and whoom, and it just hits. And I mean, those early New Jack Swing songs, like new, my favorite element of New Jack Swing is all the stuff that came out from like 90 to 93. Probably because I can actually remember it. But those early New Jack Swing songs that came out 87, 88, 89, I mean, they just have a grit and a funk to them that was unheard of. And so by putting Bobby as one of the faces of that sound with major label support, Bobby was huge. 10 million albums for a male R&B entertainer in 1989 was unheard of. Unless you were Michael Jackson or Prince. Literally. So, you know, it was interesting to see just how you know, big he was at that time. I, they kind of captured it, but they didn't. They kind of, I, I don't think you get an idea of how big Bobby was. They, they make references to it, but I mean, Bobby was a superstar. Bobby was, everybody wished, was, was wishing they could have that success at that time. Even with him being on tour New Edition, you know, the Don't Be Cruel album and Any Heartbreak Break came out the same week. Of course, Bobby was number one, Any Heartbreak was number three. And I swear, I, if I wasn't crazy, I swear when that tour ended, Bobby ended up being the headliner and New Edition ended up becoming the opening act, act or they would switch off or something like that. I can't remember. But anyway, um, and so that was the um, one thing I wish they would have done. And then even with the portrayal of Whitney, I was cool with the first half. And then once Whitney and Bobby married, Whitney became a one dimensional character. and She was just a crackhead the rest of the movie. So I kind of felt some kind of way about that, because if you're looking at the time that they really start showcasing Whitney. Mind you, could y'all get Whitney more than one wig? Y'all had her wearing the same wig the whole movie. I'm like, yo, she should have at least been on to the I'm Your Baby Tonight wig at some point in this thing. But man, I, they, and they gave her like an old lady wig too. It was like Whitney circa VH1 Divas 1999 Whitney. And I'm like, why you got Whitney looking like somebody's aunt? And they, she's supposed to be probably all at 23, 24. And y'all figure that out. It wasn't how the girl physically looked, but it's just how they made her up to look like Whitney. They had her look. Whitney was just an auntie the whole movie. Aunt Whitney. That's what I got from it. But um, what was I saying? Uh, but yeah, so it was like Whitney became a one-dimensional character once she married Bobby. And then even with Robin, yo, they had Robin pissed off in every scene. <laughs> Robin was mad. Every time you saw the camera pan Robin. Every scene, I'm like, yo, and to be honest, I think the only person who probably has all the real scoop about what really happened with Whitney and Bobby would be Robin. And you notice Robin has never gone out of her way to say anything about anybody, ever. And so I'm like, she's the one that's sitting on all the scoop. So Bobby better trade carefully because, listen, Bobby, Robin might come out and put some stuff out there that we ain't ever heard of. And even with the timing on that, that was a little off because they paint Robin to leave out and leave out of the picture, I think. I'm guessing that's 93, 94, but Robin didn't leave till 99 at the end of the My Love Is Your Love tour. So I'm like, y'all got to get the timing right. Um, but what I think they should have captured is there was a contrast or you saw a shift. Because remember, when Bobby meets Whitney, Whitney's kind of, she was on a decline at the moment, um, temporarily. And then, of course, she does that national anthem and she does the bodyguard and switches up. And so by the time 
you get to when they're married, it's painted as if Whitney's just this crackhead that's smoking and doing coke all day and not working. And I'm like, y'all got this all mixed up because Whitney was on the bodyguard tour. The bodyguard was, and the movie. That was the biggest thing out. Like uh, a soundtrack that sells 33 million copies. Like Whitney was a giant. From 92 to 94, she just stayed on tour. She was winning all these awards and everything like that. Bobby even was on tour with her, traveling, being the opening act, be, or the opening act, be, act, being the hype man. And so it was interesting that they painted her as just always in the house high. I was like, y'all got this timeline all mixed up. Um, because honestly, Whitney didn't get a lot of downtime between 92 and 98. She was always either doing a movie on tour or promoting soundtracks or an album. So I'm not saying Whitney wasn't doing drugs because we know she was. But the way that it's portrayed, it made Bobby seem like he was the level-headed one doing everything right. But mind you, Bobby wasn't doing nothing at the time. Like the Bobby album, which was one of my favorites. Get Away was my favorite song from that album. Get Away, and that's the way love is. And Two Can Play That Game. Those are some really great songs. That album, not, I might have to play that on the way to work tomorrow. Um, but I don't know. It's just, I, I understand this is a Bobby movie, so we can't make the movie about everybody else involved. But if you're going to only paint all these people in a negative light, it messes up the image that is out about them because one, Whitney's not alive to defend herself. Two, you know, Janet's probably not going to say anything about this film. Y'all better be happy her team ain't already put a cease and desist out to cancel part two of this by tomorrow. Uh, but, you know, it, I just think if you're going to put negative info out about some of these people, it has to almost be balanced with the good that they've also done so that it doesn't come out in poor taste and make you look like you're just crazy because Bobby's coming out un until the last 20 minutes of this he was looking like an angel the whole movie even though he was still cheating and doing all this other stuff it, it, it almost made it like okay it's not too bad you know he's doing all right um I don't know what else is going on but yeah because listen that that scene where he comes back home and he has those two boxes I was like yo if there's cocaine in that box when he opens it I'm turning this off I'm going to bed because I'm like y'all done turn this movie into a mad tv skit and then, and then it went from a Mad TV skit to a Tyler Perry production. But I don't know. It's, it's interesting. I really think the second half is going to be the part that's really good. Because I've always been intrigued about Bobby Brown's life after like 94. From between like 94 to life after Whitney passed. And that's when I'm like, I want to know what Bobby was up to. That's the story I we, we don't really get to hear about. So that's the part I'm interested in hearing. But overall, I do think it's entertaining. I just, I think some of the information was off. Even the miscarriage bit. I had Bobby's book and I read it before because people were trying to say, oh, you know, he said all the stuff is all true. But OK, here's the bit that got me off with the miscarriage in the movie. It's presented as if he's like super concerned and everything like that. And, you know, Kevin Costner is, is consoling her. But in the book, he was like he didn't even believe her. He thought she was making it up. And he said even to this day, he doesn't think she was ever pregnant. As a matter of fact, I had to quote here because I know y'all gonna think I was lying. He says, um... One day when I was out on tour, I got word that Whitney had suffered a miscarriage on the set of The Bodyguard. I immediately jumped on a plane to go spend time with her on the set. As soon as I arrived, I started to get suspicious. Um, I'm no medical doctor, but she was not acting like a woman um, who was in the thrones of mourning um, a lost baby. As a matter of fact, she was back to filming just a couple of days after it happened. I never saw any evidence of a pregnancy or a miscarriage, so I started to think that the entire story was a ruse created by her PR team. When I confronted her about it, she was insistent. Bobby, yes, I was pregnant, she said. But I didn't believe her. To this day, I believe her pregnancy was a story that was concocted by her people to explain to the public why she would marry Bobby Brown. In other words, if you're confused about why would she get with the bad boy, here's an explanation for you. Knocked up. After all, that's what bad boys do. Wander the countryside, knocking up innocent women. She supposedly several months into her pregnancy yet i'd never seen any hint of a belly as slim as whitney was a belly would have been visible right away as the um as was the case when she finally did get pregnant with bobby christina months later now i will say this whitney fans don't fight me whitney has always had a belly so i don't know where he got that bit from because that was one thing Whitney had always had a belly from at least like 91 onwards so i don't know where he got that from but you know what i mean it's like things kind of didn't add up because of the movie you painted it out like you you rushed to her side i don't know bobby i can't figure you out man so Oh, it's entertaining though. I will tell you that it, it, Bobby didn't live the life. This, this, that, that is a life to live. Um, I don't know. Um, I wish they would have put a little bit more emphasis on the Bobby era because there, there were some really great songs to come out of that era. Like you know, it was humping around and get away and good enough and uh, something in common. Like that was a great album. Like I could have put a little bit more emphasis on it. Um, but it is what it is. Um, I think the actor playing Bobby is doing a really great job. I just think overall, you know, I think the, the movie's okay. I don't think it's super great. 
um, and because it's hard to understand his story. I just I just think it maybe it needed to be three parts so they could be better detailed with the first half because they rushed from the end of New Edition all the way to life after the Bobby era in an hour and a half. Like they they rushed it, and really if you take and look into the element of just the music that's incorporated. They probably spent all of 20 minutes of this story on the actual music. Everything else is all the chaos and the drama. So it's hard for somebody who may not have been familiar with Bobby Brown to understand what exactly it is he did. You just know that he was high all day. <laughs> that scene did crack me up though when he showed up to the <laughs> hotel room and she was like, well, where's the stuff at? He was like, they, they ran out and then his whole nose got the powder. I'm like, y'all, I'm not doing this with y'all today. I'm going to bed. I can't. I'm tired. Anyway, let's talk about part two tomorrow. I'm out. Subscribe.